Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm just going to turn my video off. Um, and uh, as always, we'll try and keep this as interactive as possible. Just while I'm, I'm talking, I, I don't know if there's a volunteer, perhaps someone could just look at the chat group. If there's any questions, then please stop me and I'll do my best to answer. Um, okay. Keep an eye. Thanks, man. Yeah. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, guys. Hopefully you can, can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah. I can see that. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Move a few things around. Great. All right, guys. So I'm going to go go a little bit road tonight and go a little bit off off, to, off topic, uh, kind of going against what we usually do in terms of talking about pacings. But I'm going to do a little bit of an insight into a bit of a, a hopefully a nice little introduction into some EP. Um, I know it's maybe something that's not usually done um, way with you guys down there, but uh, I just thought it'd be a nice little introduction. And, and it's something you can always incorporate a little bit of pacing into this as well. So I'll try and do that the best I can. Um, as we go on but um, that's a nice little case study of a case I've done recently um, just for background I'm a I'm a cardiac physiologist I'm not a I'm not a doctor I'm, a, I'm an EP trained cardiac physiologist so uh, this is kind of my bread and butter in the hospital that I do um, so yeah this was a case that we did recently and it's going to just give us an idea about how we we look at diagnosing SVTs uh, how, we, how we break it down into working out actually what type of SVT is it and kind of our process in doing that. So I'm sure over our careers, we've all seen many of ECGs perhaps look like this, uh, a, a regular narrow complex tachycardia um, where we do our best to maybe try and diagnose what it is. But in hindsight, you know, how, how, how much depth can we really go into when we're just looking at, at, at this type of rhythm? Uh, here's another example. Again, it's a nice, a bit faster perhaps, but again, another quite narrow, regular tachycardia. And again here, uh, although this one's perhaps a little bit broader, a little bit right bundle perhaps, but again, very similar, uh, regular tachycardia. Now the thing about all these three different ECGs, although they can look in somewhat similar, all three carry very different pathologies. So trying to diagnose one, to say it looks like the other um, can be quite difficult. So that's when we take them to an EP lab so we can get some answers. And we look at these ECGs and we kind of like, well, what, what could they be? Uh, we're going to be focused on SVT. So what are these SVTs? Uh, is it an AVNRT, uh, an atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia um, with an emphasis on the node? Because we know in AV NRT, that the tachycardia is dependent on that nose. The tachycardia goes around the actual node itself. Things like the ventricle are just bystanders. And within that AV NRT, is it our typical, what we call typical AV NRT? Is it, that is, is it going down a slow pathway and going back up a fast pathway? Well, perhaps it's atypical in that it's going down a fast pathway and back up a slow pathway. Or in another atypical format, perhaps a slow, slow, where patients may have kind of two slow conducting pathways. Um, so again, things that you can't tell from an ECG, but once you get into the cath lab and put the catheters in the right spaces and do your thing, you can start to bring all these things out and start get a really good diagnosis of actually what we're treating. The other option is, is it an AVRT, an atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia? That is... Uh, where here is more dependent on more of a pathway and the ventricle is very much in this instance part of the circuit so the ventricle is very much you know helping drive this tachycardia as where in AVNRT as I said it's more the nodal that is helping drive this tachycardia now in sinus rhythm we can all we've all seen these what we call overt pathways or what we know commonly known as WPW or Wolf Parkinson White where a patient presents has a 12 lead ECG and they have a nice very short PR interval, a delta wave. And that's quite quite easy from a 12 lead in sinus rhythm to diagnose. And that tells you straight away that the patient, well, yes, they have a pathway and um, they are at risk of uh, having AVRTs. 
Um, but perhaps it's a concealed pathway and you do a do a 12 lead ECG and it looks very, very, very much normal and concealed pathway telling you that perhaps that this patient, well, we don't know if they've got a pathway at all until you actually get into the cath lab, but we know with WPW that there is a pathway present and that pathway conducts from the A to the V. And that's very important when it comes to, again, diagnosing our SVT is the conduction of the pathway. Is it going from A to V? like it does in WPW, or perhaps going from V to A, and we need to work that out. And in tachycardia, patients that do go into AVRT tachycardias, um, we use terminology like antidromic, meaning that is the tachycardia going from down the accessory pathway and going back up the node, and that's known as antidromic. Or is it more the more common that we commonly see, is it more the orthodromic, meaning that it's going down the AV node from A to V, then back up to the A via a pathway, and that's known as orthodromic. So we look at these in context with some maybe some 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 pictures here, and we know that you know with all of us, most of us sitting here tonight, we're in sinus rhythm, hopefully, and we're conducting from the atrium. Signal enters the AV node here via the fast pathway and down to our ventricle. Okay, that's our normal sinus pathway conduction. But every now and then you may get an, sorry, just to go back, thing to point out with our fast and slow pathways is that very important to understand that the fast pathway, as the name suggests, it conducts from A to B quite rapidly, okay? quite slick in its movement. But the thing is, it's very slow to recover. So it has a long refractory period. As where the slow pathway, as you can predict, it conducts slowly, but it is able to recover quite quickly meaning it has a relatively short refractory period. So it's important to understand the pathology of these uh, as we move on to understanding what ABNRT is all about. Now, if you're sitting here in sinus rhythm, suddenly you might get an atrial ectopic, okay? That atrial ectopic tries to enter the AV node via the fast pathway. But as we said, because it's slow to recover, it's probably still recovering from the previous signal that went down it. So instead of being able to go down this fast pathway here, it's blocked. So it has no choice if the patient has a slow pathway that it goes down the slow pathway instead, making its way down to the ventricle. Now, as it does that, by the time it does get through the AV node, usually then at that point, the fast pathway has recovered. Okay, so we've gone down the slow and the fast way at this point has recovered. So it's able to now go back up the fast pathway within the AV node and back to the atrium. And if this continues, and this is our mechanism for AVNRT, as the tachycardia goes down the slow pathway to our ventricle, as it's going into the ventricle, it's going back up a fast pathway, activating the atrium again. And then that from that atrium, that then signal then re-enters the slow pathway, and we have the mechanism for AVNRT. Some important anatomy as well to understand within the right atrium, which helps understand kind of, especially for the uh, the physician who's doing the, uh, and the electrophysiologist who's doing the study is, is this kind of anatomical structure that we may all probably have probably all heard of is this triangle of pop, where it's kind of this triangle, anatomical triangle that they use to understand certain landmarks within the right atrium. Because we know if we use the kind of anteriorly, the tricuspid annulus here, creating one side of the triangle. Then posteriorly here, we have this tendon of Tazaro and this eustachian ridge within the right atrium. And at the base, we're using the, uh, the, um, the ostium of the coronary sinus, okay, where that enters. Um, so we're using that. And when we draw all that up anatomically, we end up with this triangle of top. And that represents, at the peak of the triangle here, we can see that that represents where our kind of AV node is. So we obviously want to stay well clear of that. Posteriorly of that, we have our fast pathway, okay, as we spoke about before, fast pathway entering into the uh, AV node through here. Or for those people that do have it, a slow pathway, which is located to more, more inferiorly down here that enters the fast pathway in that way. Now, during an AV and RT ablation, the key here is to always modify the slow pathway. You never, ever want to ablate the fast pathway, okay? So it's important to understand these anatomical landmarks and making sure that we are actually, if we are ablating an ABNRT, that we do actually ablate the slow pathway. So that's just a nice little graphical representation of kind of 
the anatomical structures that the uh, the physician's looking for when uh, when they're inserting their catheters and performing an ablation. On the flip side, we have uh, the AVRT. Okay, and as we said before, uh, patients who present with WPW, we know that they have antrograde conduction from A to V through the accessory pathway. Um, and also, yeah, we know that we get this kind of delta looking wave here. Which hey, is hey, Jared. Sorry. Oh, yeah, go on. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I think you're muffling a little bit when you when you turn your head or something because we're, we're having a little trouble sometimes hearing you. Okay, mate. I'll try and look. How's that? Is that more clearer? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's perfect. perfect. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. I'll move a little bit closer to the speaker as well. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so as we move on to AVRT, a nice little graphical representation here is um, antrograde conduction. So we know in WPW we have conduction across a pathway, okay? So going from A to V via a pathway, which gives us this nice little delta wave that we see on people we present with WPW. And then you also get this kind of quite fused because it's fusing with the also the antrograde conduction through the AB node as it goes down the Hispakinji system. So you begin with this quite broad looking uh, signal, which is thanks to our accessory pathway. And then we follow it up with what a relatively sharp looking signal here, which is as it goes down the Hispakinji system. So you end up with this kind of fused looking delta wave, which is kind of a classic for WPW. And then as we spoke about before, there are two types of tachycardia during AVRT. And the first one and the most common that we see is this orthodromic, where the tachycardia Enters the a, uh, enters the AV node from the A, goes down the hypothalamic system to the ventricle, and then back retrogradually through uh, the retrogradually through the pathway. Right. And it's important to understand all of these because we need to know when we're in the cath lab, the kind of the conduction mechanisms of uh, the signals are they can they conduct from A to V or can they conduct from V to A and be more more apparent later on. The alternative is the antidromic, which is for me personally, I've only ever seen once or twice in 15 years. So it's quite rare uh, for me personally, anyway, where the tachycardia, okay, very similar mechanism, but instead of going down the node, this time it's going down the pathway and going back up the AV node. And this can be quite scary to see on an ECG because it's very broad, um, it's very fast. Because we've got to understand the properties as well of an accessory pathway. We, we know that an AV node has um, decremental properties, is where an accessory pathway doesn't seem to have decremental properties. So it's quite it's quite open for very rapid signal through here. So it can look quite scary in someone who is in antigromic AVRT. It can present. You may think it is a broad complex VT or something like that. So trying to have an understanding of that is uh, quite important as well. Hey, Jared, it's, it's just a little bit muffled again still. Still, mate. Okay. Um, it could just be your connection, but it, maybe it's. Am I breaking up or am I just muffled? It just all of a sudden turns muffled, like you're speaking through a pillow or something. <laughs> oh, okay, mate. I'll see what I can do. Uh, yeah, appreciate it. Keep interrupting if I uh, if that keeps happening. So we've got a bit of background knowledge there. I hope of just kind of things we need to look for. So. Um, so let's have a look at our, our, our patient here that we, uh, our little case study. So we've got a 20 year old female, structurally normal heart. She has a history of palpitations, uh, classically sudden onset, sudden offset, meaning it comes on quick, comes off quickly. Uh, she had a recent admission to A&E with tachycardia. Oh, sorry, something's popping up there. Uh, with the tachycardia, uh, which was successfully treated with adenosine, okay, which is, uh, so a red flag, you know, things you want to think about when it comes to uh, the mechanism of a tachycardia. And she was then further discharged for cardiology review. So based on that history, it's, you know, it's a classic symptoms for an SVT. But the question is always is, well, what could it be? So we brought her in. Um, first thing we always do is we do a 12 lead ECG. Now, from the moment the patient walks into the cath lab, I'm always kind of working on this kind of rule in, rule out kind of workflow pattern. Um, of all the things we just spoke about previously, I'm kind of looking, all right, well, can it be this or can it not be that? So I'm always trying to rule things in, or I'm also trying to rule things out more importantly, because the more things we can rule out, then we get to our diagnosis a lot quicker. So we can look at this 12 lead ECG. It's 
pretty unremarkable. It's a narrow complex. PR interval looks fairly normal. Uh, in my eyes, there's no evidence of a delta wave. Um, so I think from the even just from putting on a baseline ECG, I can rule out WPW in this patient. Um, so what I'm ruling out is this patient does not have anterograde conduction across a pathway. She still may have retrograde conduction across a pathway from V to A, but certainly she's not having any anterograde conduction across a pathway as we see in WPW. So I'm ruling out WPW in this instance. The next thing we do is we then, uh, we put in our catheters. Now a standard EP study, uh, a textbook study anyway, would be a four wire study. Uh, it can be done with three wires and there's certainly some operators that do it with a two wire study as well. But certainly for tonight's instance, we're going to we use the four wire study in this uh, in this case. And first catheter we put in is a white right catheter. Okay, it's a quadrupolar catheter that sits in the high right atrium, and we use this purely just to paste the right atrium. The second one is the CF catheter. Okay, so this enters the coronary sinus. It's a decapolar catheter, meaning it has ten electrodes, and we have our proximal signals here at the ostium of the CF. And that wraps around the annulus of the right atrium, uh, ending up here on the lateral three wall of the right atrium. And that gives us a really nice representation of right to left activation across the uh, across the atriums. The third one we put in is a very important his catheter that gives us not just our landmarks of where the his kind of AV node uh, junction is, but it also gives us some very important signals uh, that we'll touch on in a moment. And they're important that we, when we measure these signals, we understand what's going on with these signals. And the fourth catheter we use is a, an RV catheter, which we just put in the RV apex, which we use to paste the ventricle. And um, we use that again as our kind of a diagnostic tool as we move forward. So once all those catheters are in and we've got all our signals, first thing we want to do is just do some very basic intervals. Uh, there are three intervals we do. Uh, the PA interval, not we don't really measure it very often, but the PA interval represents the conduction time from the sinoatrial node through the atrium to the AV node. Okay, it just gives us an idea of what the intraatrial conduction time is, and that usually should be fairly slick in a in a twenty year old. And in this instance, it was. But perhaps if you've got scarring in the right atrium, then your PA interval might be quite delayed. The other interval we measure, which is quite important, is the AH interval, okay? And this is conduction within the AV node. This is telling me how quick signals are traveling through the AV node. Um, and are they passing through a fast pathway or a slow pathway? And commonly anyway- I'm muffled again, Jared. Sorry, mate, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, thank you, sorry. No, don't be sorry. Um, and a common signal here would be anywhere between 55 and 135 milliseconds. Then the third signal we look for, or the interval we look for, is the HV signal. And this is measurement of the conduction time through the Hispakinji system down to the ventricle. Now, all of these signal, signals, as we see on our 12 lead e ECG, actually makes up our PR interval. And We've all seen many people with first degree heart block on an ECG, but not really understanding perhaps what is causing that heart, uh, that first degree heart block. Is it conduction, intraatrial conduction, maybe a long PA, or perhaps worst case, is it a, a long conduction through the HV interval? If it's a long PA interval, the prognosis isn't too bad, but the further we go down this chain of events, as if we're having quite normal PA and H interval, that our HV interval, meaning our conduction through the histopathy system is quite long, then the prognosis uh, and the, the chances of high grade AV, AV block significantly go up. And it's these type of patients that probably will end up having pacemakers later on down the future. So once we'd, uh, once we got all our catheters in, this is what our, kind of our, our signals look like. Uh, uh, we did a three wire study on this patient. Uh, so you can see our his catheter here in yellow. We've got our nice kind of CS catheter here, giving us all these nice atrial signals in the CS. And then we've got this red one, which is our right ventricle. And I did the AH intervals here, the AH. It's very hard to see there, I'm sorry. But we also did the HV and we can see, I can promise you that they were very normal. So uh, we proceeded on to our next steps. So once all our catheters are in, we then want to look at maybe uh, inducing a tachycardia because obviously we're not going to know what we're treating unless we can induce a tachycardia. 
Um, the first thing we always do is we like to paste the ventricle. And we do this using a drive, what we call a drive train. And this is made up of eight beats, a bit like almost like ATP. These eight beats are made up of the same interval. So typically it's around 600 milliseconds uh, or about 100 beats a minute. And we give eight of these pulses. Then after those eight pulses, we give an, what we call an extra beat. And this is almost like throwing in an extra atrial ectopic or a ventricular ectopic, depending where you're pacing from. And we usually start that around 460 milliseconds. And then what we do is we repeat this drive train. And every time we repeat it, this extra beat comes down by 20 milliseconds, 460, 440, 420, et cetera, getting shorter and shorter and shorter until hopefully we uh, either induce a tachycardia or we end up in refractoritis where we either find the refractoritis of the AV node or perhaps the ventricle itself doesn't capture. And then we know we've, we can stop at that point. So while we, when we're pacing the ventricle, we, we're kind of asking ourselves three questions. Really. And again, we're trying to rule in things, rule out things as we do this. Now, the first question we do ask ourselves is, do we have VA conduction? Now, if the answer is no, meaning that as we pace the ventricle, if we do not have signals going from the V to the A, then we do not have VA conduction. Now, as I said before, with AVRT, it's important that you have VA conduction, whether it's across the node or via a pathway. But for this sustained attack of cardio of ABRT, you need to have VA conduction. If we don't, then straight away we can rule out ABRT as a possible mechanism for this tachycardia. If the patient does have VA conduction, they have conduction from the V to the A, then we can move on to our next phase during the pacing. And we so then we look at is the VA time decremental? Now we know, as I said before, that decremental properties across the node. Uh, are, are there's decremental properties, sorry, within the node, meaning that the more you, you know, the quicker you pace it, the longer those signals get. Um, as where a pathway doesn't have this decremental properties, doesn't matter how quick you pace it, those signals will go through at the same rate. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at that VA time and I'm wondering, is that VA time getting longer and longer, the quicker I pace, or is it staying the same? If it gets longer, then it suggests that that VA conduction is going across a node, across the AV node. If that VA time is fixed, meaning it doesn't change at all, it's very, very prognostic that it's probably going across a pathway. Then I'll move on to a look at what the CS activation is doing. Again, this is a very prognostic tool. I look at, is it what we call concentric? Is it normal? Is it going from the ventricle through the AV node Activating the right atrium and the CS from proximal to distal. I Meaning, is it going from the right atrium, propagating across to the left atrium? Or is it eccentric? Is it going from the V and activating the distal side of the CS? Now, as we said before, that CS distal is sitting right on that lateral free wall of the mitral annulus. So it's quite nowhere near the right atrium. It's almost on the other side of the left atrium. So that would be very suggestive that there perhaps there is a left lateral pathway if you see that activation in the CS. So we're doing all of this whilst we're doing this ventricular pacing. And again, we're ruling things out and ruling things in as we do that. So I did some uh, retrograde pacing on this patient. And the first thing we can see here is that I'm pacing here at the ventricle, okay, which is the red. And you can see also here on our nice, on our ECG, we've got a very broad looking complex, very suggestive of uh, the Marvi pacing going on here. And what you can also hopefully pick up is that for every RV pacing, there is an atrial beat. Okay. So my first question was, do we have a VA conduction? And the answer is yes. Okay. Meaning that I now I still can't rule out AVRT or AVNRT. So we have VA conduction in this patient going from the V and this green signal here represents the atrium. So for every V, there is an A. So we have VA conduction. The next thing I ask myself is, is it decremental? Is the extra beat here that you can see here at the bottom? Every time I pace it, does this V to A time get longer? Now, unfortunately, I couldn't, couldn't show you. That, that last, it, it cut off a little bit there. Okay, mate, I'll go back. Thank you. So we, we've determined we have VA conduction. And the next bit we want to determine is do we have VA decrementation? So is that signal from the ventricle to the atrium delaying? If it does, 
then we think it's nodal. If it doesn't delay, mm -hmm. we think that this is the hump going through the path area. And it's hard to represent here, but I can promise you that this VA time did not decrement. So in my mind, I was starting to think, wow, perhaps we have a pathway here. So the next thing I did is we kept pacing. And the third thing we look at is CS activation. So again, we paced the ventricle. We've got one-to-one -one conduction. And I'm not, hopefully you can see it here, trust me otherwise, is that when I pace the ventricle, the first signal I see in the atrium is CS distal, the CS12 catheter. And we said before that if that's the first one that's leading, then perhaps it's um, telling us that we have a left lateral pathway. And as I pace the ventricle, the first activation in the atrium was actually the CS distal catheter. Which meaning it was that's located right on that left free wall of the left atrium. So I was getting pretty excited here to think we probably in this instance, and it's very, very diagnostic of this patient now having a left lateral pathway. Just so it's more clear, do you mind bringing up that uh, conduction system of the heart really quick, just so you can show that? This with one? Your, no, the actual conduction, the image of the heart you had, just to demonstrate left lateral position in the CS. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't backtrack. Right, this one? Yeah, that one or the other, whichever one. Yeah, yeah, exactly, though. But just, just so everyone can kind of see what he means by the distal tip of the CS catheter and the activation exactly. uh, so, orientation. You see the CS catheter coming in here. Our proximal CS catheter is located here in the right atrium at the CS ostium, the opening of the firing sinus. Our CS distal 1-2 is located all the way around on this left lateral kind of left atrium here, this left free wall of the left atrium of the mitral annulus. So this whole catheter kind of spans the whole of the right atrium from the right side all the way across to the left. Now, if I'm pacing down here, at the RV apex, and my signal is going through the ventricle, through the AV node, we will then usually activate see a proximal first. But in this instance, I'm pacing the ventricle, and the CS distal is getting activated first, meaning that my signal is hitting the atrium somewhere around here, okay? Far away from the AV node, so the only... <coughs> We can't hear you again, Jared. <laughs> Sorry. The only way it's going to get from the V to the A is through the heart. Still can't hear you properly, Jared. Okay, yeah. Can yeah, that's better. Yeah. How's that? That's yeah. better. Yeah. Is the is the pickup on your mic like on the bottom of the laptop? Maybe it's getting covered up or something. Oh, okay. I'm not sure if it's on like a soft surface. Sometimes that'll do it. I'm sitting on a desk, but I'll um, let me. I'll oh. just adjust a few things. Bear with me, guys. Sorry. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> I'll try that because I'm. And we'll see how that goes. I've moved the laptop a bit. Brilliant. <clears throat> Down to right at the moment. Brilliant. Beautiful. Um. So yeah, if I'm pacing the ventricle and our CS distal is leading, like we're seeing in our example here, that means that the atrium is getting activated first somewhere around here, which is suggestive that it probably a pathway causing that. Because if it was proximal, then we know the AV node is over here somewhere, but we're a long way away from the AV node. So we're thinking that this is probably now a left lateral pathway that we're going to be dealing with. And again, just to show you the picture here, we can see it here on this signal. It's not very clear, but you can see that there is a bit of a slant on this CS lead here, suggesting that that CS activation is getting. Uh, led here from the distal catheter first as it makes its way up to the atrium. So even though we've probably got a very clear diagnosis of what we're treating, it, we can't just stop there. We still have to perhaps perform all these other maneuvers and the other, so we've paced the ventricle. Now, the other thing we want to do now is pace the, uh, the atrium. And when we do that, we want, again, we use the same kind of uh, maneuvers. We give a drivetrain followed by an extra beat and we bring that extra beat down continuously. And we're looking for a few things again. And the first thing we do is, well, do we have AV conduction? So hopefully the answer is yes. And But the question is, is, is it going via the node or a pathway? Now, we said before when we looked at her ECG that there was no evidence of a delta wave. So we know that, yes, she does have AV conduction. 
But because there's no evidence of a delta wave, then, then this means this AV conduction is all going through the node. And if the answer is no to AV conduction, then well, that's when you panic and you call Dr. Adafi and the patient needs a pacemaker. But next thing we do is then we look at that AH interval, which is what we just spoke about a little bit before, which is that interval, that conduction through the AV node. Okay. Now, and again, we know that the AV node is decremental. So as we pace the atrium, we can, use, and in this instance, we're using the coronary sinus catheter here to pace the atrium. We measure the time from the atrium to the ventricle. And if that time decrements and with every extra beat, then we know that that is going through, um, going through the node. If that time is fixed, uh, not in this patient, but if that time is fixed, then we know uh, that that's probably going from the A to the V via a pathway because we know that these pathways do not have decremental properties, okay? No matter how quick you pace them, remember, the signal will go through at exactly the same rate. So, but we can rule out that in this patient because we know she didn't have a delta wave. And then the other thing we look for, and this is the most important thing is, and this is when we're, when we're doing these maneuvers, we're more ruling out in uh, whether it's AV and RT here. And we're looking for a thing called dual nodal physiology. Now we all know most of us sitting here will have a fast, conduction pathway into our AV node. But some people out there have both, known as a dual nodal physiology. And then the more we pace that uh, atrium, the quicker we pace the node, eventually, perhaps at some point, it's going to jump from the fast pathway onto the slow pathway, because the fast pathway cannot just handle the rate at which we're pacing. And we do that by looking at this AH interval. And we continually measure this AH interval and if we get a jump, what we call a jump of greater than 50 milliseconds from the preceding beat, that is evident that it's jumped from a fast pathway to a slow pathway. And that's very important in the diagnosis of potential AV NRT. So we can have a look at this with this patient here. We were pacing the atrium here in the green. And I was measuring from the atrium to the ventricle. And you can see it here, even just on the QRS. And that number was 124. And then we paced a little bit quicker and it went to 142 milliseconds. So it's decrementing. So I know it's going through the node. And then the next beat went from 142 to 194. So that's a jump of greater than 50 milliseconds. So I know that from this beat here, it's quite short, suggestive to me that it's going down the fast pathway into the AV node. But then we get this big jump of greater than 50 milliseconds, which tells me that when I put in this extra beat, the fast pathway was still refractory. Therefore, the only way you could get to the ventricle was going now down the slow pathway. I repeated that maneuver again, and we had further decrementation through the node. So we paste the atrium. It goes down to the ventricle. Okay, you can see the QRS here. But what is evident that it then goes from the ventricle it goes back up the atrium, goes back up to the atrium, but via our pathway that's located on our left lateral pathway towards the left atrium. And I know that because this CS distal catheter is leading first. Okay, so we have a conduction through the AV node, down to here, down to the ventricle, from the ventricle, back up to the atrium. And that's known as an echo beat. And um, so you can start getting a little bit excited. So we repeated that maneuver again. And next, before you knew it, we had tachycardia, where we paced the atrium. It went through the AV node here, down to the ventricle, back up to the atrium via the pathway, activates the atrium, atrium conducts, contracts, sends signal back through the AV node, back up the pathway, down to the ventricle and back up the pathway. And that continues on. And we have a tachycardia. We then measure the tachycardia. The tachycardia continues. It was around 350 milliseconds, about 170 beats per minute, so pretty quick. And from that, we have our diagnosis of an orthodromic AVRT, meaning that this patient has conduction from the atrium through the node down the hispokinji system and then back up 
a pathway located here in our left lateral left of the left atrium. And you can see this catheter here is a representation of our coronary sinus catheter. And we said here before that CS distal, this one, two catheter here was getting activated first. And this is the mechanism of an orthodromic AVRT. And this is what this patient had. So based on that diagnosis, we then, um, first we tried to get her out of the tachycardia because it's uh, we didn't really want to perform, uh, treat the treat the patient during tachycardia. So we just paced her out of it. So we measured the cycle length of the tachycardia. Again, a bit like ATP or an ICD. And um, we kind of paced her out of it using a bit of ATP from the right ventricular catheter. So then what we did is we put in a mapping catheter, an ablation catheter, which is depicted here in these white signals. Okay, this is now our ablation catheter. Now the ablation catheter is what delivers the radio frequency energy to hopefully eliminate and burn this pathway. And we did this by pacing, we, we chose to pace the right ventricle. Okay, we did this via uh, the coronary site, uh, the his Purkinje catheter, which is located, we pushed it into the right ventricle. We took the RV catheter out and we replaced that with the uh, mapping catheter instead. So we didn't have to make another puncher in the leg. So we took that catheter out and put the map catheter in instead. So in that sense, as a reciprocal, we use the his Purkinje catheter uh, to pace our ventricle. And what we found is again, what, when we paced the ventricle, we had VA conduction, which is what we were expected to see. And we can see that the CS distal is leading. So we knew that we were in the right spot. We were having conduction across a pathway. We were happy with our signals. So we started performing ablation. And what you can see here between this picture and this picture here is that we're still pacing the ventricle, but our time from, we now do not have, for every ventricular pace to beat, you will see that we do not have an atrial event meaning that we have block now, we have VA conduction block caused by our ablation, meaning that hopefully now that is a successful endpoint for our ablation. We found the pathway, we mapped it, we ablated, and suddenly we lose our VA conduction time, our VA conduction, meaning now that she now does not have VA conduction across the node, or more importantly, through the pathway, because we've ablated that. Is that clear? Can you see that? So that's, again, during pacing, before ablation, and then we came on ablation, and then you can suddenly see here, we have a lot more Vs than As, suggestion that we have VA block across the pathway, which is a great endpoint. And Jared, sorry, just to clarify, so you burned, the pathway was not part of the node, it was separate. Um, exactly. Yeah, how often do you burn and then you realize they also have retrograde through the node since that's like common, what, 30 to 40% of people have VA conduction? Yeah, yeah. I don't know the, the stats, exact stats behind it, but um, but certainly, I mean, and that's something you've got to look look out for when you're um, doing your pacing maneuvers is that when, you, when you're pacing the ventricle and you kind of, uh, you're looking at, you know, if it's a pathway because of the CS activation, especially in this instance, but um, you can then lose pathway refractory. You could have, you know, your pathway could block, but you could still have uh, conduction through your node. So what would happen in this instance, if we lost uh, pacing through the pathway, we would, would see our CS distal leading. And then once we ablate the pathway, if we still had VA conduction through the node, then that CS signal would almost flip on itself. Instead of going like this way, it would then suddenly go in this direction here, where we see the CS proximal leading first as it's conducting through the node instead. So it's a very subtle change, but it's a change that it's important that you see as well. Um, you don't necessarily always see VA block. Now this VA block isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't mean that the patient has heart block or anything like that. It just means that they're not now conducting from the ventricle to the atrium. Uh, meaning that they can certainly now not sustain AVRT. She can still have AVNRT because we know that uh, relates to the actual AV node itself, the tachycardia, but she certainly now cannot have an AVRT. So at the end of the ablation, we, um, we did some more uh, pacing maneuvers just to um, make sure 
that everything was was all in order. And we found that right at the end, we paced the ventricle. And as AJ just pointed out, her um, the kind of her VA conduction will recovered, but we we're happy to say that it's not really clearly depicted here, but CS proximal is at the top and we can see that activation is a little bit different now. CS proximal is now leading. And that told us that we had now had VA conduction across the AV node and we and not the pathway. So we knew that by that point, we had successively ablated her, uh, her pathway and she was uh, sent home and she did well. And that's the end of that, guys. Excellent. Uh, one, one question, um, Gerard. <clears throat> so one, once that pathway is ablated, can it drill back again? Like, is that like permanently gone or can it come back again? No, they, they can come back very quickly within seconds, uh, within minutes, uh, sometimes within days. Um, very rarely, uh, well, what I've found anyways, I, I can't remember the last time I ever did a redo pathway ablation, meaning that once once they're ablated, if they don't recover within kind of the first 15 to 20 minutes, they're usually pretty good in the sense that they usually will not recover. So it's important that once we did this ablation, we usually then sit around for about 20 to 30 minutes um, and just give it time for it to recover. Because sometimes when you do this ablation, you may just create some edema around the cells. You're not actually killing off the cells. You may just almost be putting like a band-aid effect. And then eventually that band-aid falls off and then these signals can conduct again. So it's very important that you have like a waiting time at the end of the procedure just to make sure that, um, that uh, yeah, that pathway is definitely blocked. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Matt. Great lecture, AJ. Um, Gerard, um, it's very good lecture. So the maximum time you wait why, during the abl ablation in the, uh, in the EP lab, is it 30 minutes? It varies. It varies on the operator. Um, most operators I work with is anywhere but to say around 20 minutes from the, um, from the point of block. And when you've performed that uh, ablation and you've seen block in the pathway, uh, usually sit around for about 20 minutes. Now we don't just sit there during that 20 minutes where we're doing pacing maneuvers, which we briefly went through just before. So we're constantly pacing the ventricle and making sure that we have lost that VA conduction through the pathway. But I also do some atrial pacing as well, just to make sure that there's not another tachycardia that's um, is a bit like a bystander. So maybe we saw this AVRT, but perhaps she may have another tachycardia that was not uh, that was not prevalent before. So we're doing a lot of pacing maneuvers during that twenty to thirty minute wait, just to make sure we don't bring out any other tachycardia. Good, excellent. Um, uh, my second question is on uh, if it is uh, uh, the if the problem is within the AV node where you have a fast pathway and a slow pathway. If you are to take out the, uh, uh, the, the pathway, you are going to take out the slow pathway. Um, how do you go about it in your lab, sir? Yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the, op the operator will use, uh, as we go back, mm -hmm. So they'll use their anatomical landmarks. Um, we also sometimes use some 3D mapping, a 3D mapping system. Um, there's many out there. Abbott do one, uh, Biosense Webster do one. There's many, so we can use like a 3D mapping system so we can create a geometry of the right atrium. So we know where the anatomical structures are. But a bit like you as, a, as, a, as an operator, you kind of know your anatomical landmarks um, and, you know, whether it's getting venous access, you kind of like your, your great lecture last week on uh, venous access, you kind of know your anatomical landmarks. And these uh, electrophysiologists, again, they know exactly the landmarks they're looking for. But they also kind of have in, uh, in their mind this kind of this triangle that they use and that they know that it, they're quite, quite low below the coronary sinus of the ostium. That's the location of the slow pathway. And the more they creep up past that coronary sinus, then they're at risk of 
getting closer to the fast pathway, which is what we don't want. So it's important that they're just using X-ray, they're using 3D mapping systems, um, they're using their signals on the catheter. So yeah. we're making sure when we're using the ablation catheter that we don't have any hiss signals on there, uh, meaning that we're very close to this AV node. So it's really understanding, uh, looking at your signals um, and understanding what we're looking for there. And then when we're ablating, usually when we're on the right spot, when we're ablating the slow path, we end up, you put the patient into like a junctional rhythm, uh, which is very normal. It's a very good sign that you're actually on the slow pathway. Um, and we look for a nice kind of slow, regular junctional rhythm. If that junctional rhythm ever accelerates, then we know we're probably creeping up towards the fast pathway. So it's very important then that we uh, stop ablating. And also if we ever lose kind of um, conduction, one-to-one -one AV conduction, then it's very important obviously then that we stop because we do not want to be ablating around the AV node because the risk of heart block is very high. Very high, yeah. Because it's one of the commonest complication of uh, ablating around the risk of converting the patient to heart block. Exactly, exactly. And uh, yeah, and that's why it's very important that these operators are you know, obviously very skilled at what they do and they know their landmarks. And when we're performing the ablation, it's usually uh, myself, you know, with the ablation pedals. So I'm very, very, you know, cautious and I'm very looking at the signals and looking, looking out for those signals and making sure I don't see anything too strange and making sure that I'd come off that uh, ablation catheter very quickly if we do see anything that But um, yeah. Thank you very much. And it's a really nice one to do just to throw in a bit of pacing as well. It's something that I, I teach everyone to do in, in the pacing clinic during a follow up or even during an implant. It's really nice to, um, when you're testing the RV lead, whether it's a threshold check or whatever it may be, is just put the patient into VVI at say 90 and have a look and see if the patient does have VA conduction. Um, you're obviously not going to be able to get the detail of kind of the, the catheters like we do an EP study, but you kind of know that if the patient does not have VA conduction at all, whether it's through a node or a pathway, then if you ever get a follow-up of your pacing patient and they've got runs of tachycardia, then you probably know that the tachycardia probably is not an SVP, um, certainly not an AVRT anyway, um, because they haven't got VA conduction. So you can probably help you diagnose your patients a little bit better, um, perhaps more ruling in things like an atrial tachycardia more so than an SVP. So it's a quite a useful tool that I always use. And, um, yeah, I'm always doing a VA conduction test in, all, in every patient with a pacemaker just to help me later on down the track. If they ever come back with a tachycardia, I can look back and go, right, this patient does or does not have AVRT. And it just, just gives you a, a little little help when it comes to diagnosing uh, some maybe an atrial tachycardia when they come back with one. Yeah, sorry, sorry, um, Jared. Can you repeat that bit again? Because I, I left the room and I missed that bit. That's really important, actually. No worries, mate. Um, I'll, I'll say the whole thing again. Um, so I was just saying that when um, any patient that I see, whether it's an implant or uh, this is pacing um, or during a follow-up, I always perform a VA conduction test. Okay. Um, and the reason I do that is because I want to, like I said, you're never going to be able to get the, the detail of signals that we get inside the heart, like an EP study, because, but you've only got, if you've only got two leads, but what you do see is you can either rule in or rule out VA conduction. And if they do not have VA conduction, then you know straight away that the chances of this patient ever having AVRT is almost zero because you need to have VA conduction to have AVRT. They're still at risk of having AVNRT, but you know that if they present with a tachycardia, um, that it's probably going to be more of an atrial tachycardia more than an AVRT tachycardia. Excellent. Thank you. And I usually just do that, do it at VVI, perhaps 90 beats per minute. Um, and if you find, and then I, if they're VA block at 90, I usually go to 80 just to make sure I'm not at some kind of refractory period. Um, so as long as I'm above their sinus rate, uh, maybe 10 to 20 beats above their sinus rate, it's usually enough. Excellent. Thank 
to your, to your point, Jared, too, while you're doing that, it also helps with programming of your PVAR or most particular atrial refractor to, so you don't get PMT. Um, so I think that like a recommendation is for anyone, obviously check for VA conduction because it can help with your diagnosis later. And also because it's just proper programming of PVARP as well. Yeah, exactly. But question for you there though. Um, and one thing that I've wondered, you know, we have intermittent AV conduction. Have you seen like intermittent retrograde conduction? Like for say, for example, you tested at one point, they don't have it, but down the road, they could have it kind of yeah. scenario. Um. Through a pathway, not so much. It, it, it depends. I mean, every pathway has a refractory period. So, um, so whether that refractory period is, and we do it uh, just to go back a bit. We, if someone presents with WPW, an AV conducting pathway conduct that conducts from the A to the B, we look at the refractoriness of that pathway. Now, if that, what I mean is, is that. We test, we pace the atrium as quick as we can, or we gradually pace 100, 150 beats per minute, maybe up to close to maybe 200 beats per minute sometimes. And we're looking at how long, how quick it conducts through that pathway A to B. Um, if that pathway doesn't conduct at 120 beats per minute, then we, that means that that pathway is not dangerous. It means you can almost leave it because we know that if they're ever going to get uh, an antrodromic tachycardia that is through the pathway and back up the node, and they're not at risk of getting rapid ventricular rates and at risk of almost like a sudden cardiac death because of it. Um, so it's important that we look at the properties of the pathway. Um, but even in your instance, with pathway, I've never really seen them there one minute, go on the next. Um, you do see it a lot with like I've AV nodal conduction. Um, Just allow him to come there, but not to start her. You can um, mute, mute, mute yourself, whoever I'm speaking. There's a speaker on there. Hello, Jacqueline. There we go. We got it. <laughs> Interesting. So, uh, Jared, one last thing to kind of, that, that's really helpful. So, would you say most instances then of retrograde that we observe is actually path pathway and not through the node? Because I think, like, I'll tell you, like, us people who are just caught in CRM, we don't really focus on pathways. We just focus on either retrograde or not. We don't think, where is it coming from? Yeah, no, no. So to answer your question, I think a bit a little bit clearer then, sorry. Um, if there is VA conduction, completely just doing a VA conduction test in a pacemaker, we will never know if it's through the node or through a pathway. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So I suppose you could get you could get a little bit funky. Maybe you could pace it 80, measure the VA time. Mm. Pace it 90, measure the VA time. Pace it 100, measure the VA time. If that VA time is getting longer and longer, it's suggestive that it's nodal. Nodal properties. Okay. If it's fixed, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, depends how brave you are. If it's fixed, then you could hypothesize maybe it's a pathway. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't my house in there. okay interesting yeah because I, I typically it's a yeah, fun I, diagnostic tool yeah I, I was always taught to test retrograde at like different rates one because you can find the block rate um but you can also find like if it has decremental properties so that's interesting to think it actually could just be a pathway that not yeah able. yeah exactly so i'm more doing it yeah not to say is it pathway or is it nodal i'm more just yeah, to yeah. say is is there conduction and uh oh, yeah, it, yeah. But I would, yeah, I wouldn't be brave enough to say it's certainly, I'd be brave to say there's VA conduction, but I wouldn't be brave to say it was via a pathway. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if it was going to be always pathway, but it's six to one after. Okay, perfect. I've, I've, I've also heard, um, Jared, about like um, like a double anti like conduction physiology. So conditions have to be met that... Yeah, if, if basically you got an atrial event, atrial signal coming through, um, which is a long PI interval. Um, so it activates it activates both slow and fast pathway at the same time. The ventricle is activated twice. Yeah, that is a very rare phenomenon, but it's a, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the two for one phenomenon, we call yeah, it. Yeah, two for one phenomenon, absolutely. Exactly, is where you... Uh, you get a sinus beat that goes down the fast pathway 
uh, or even a slow pathway first, and then you get an ectopic that may go down the other pathway, and they actually kind of meet. Um, you get these two atrial signals uh, for every one ventricular signal. So yeah. it's um, yeah, quite rare, but it's certainly out there, and I have seen it once. Um, but it is a cool, quite a cool phenomenon as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> And the other thing, just to touch on, and as again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so but I'm sure that the doctors online will know a lot better than me. But um, it's important that when patients are presenting to say A and E, and you know, you don't know a patient may have WPW, but you know, with WPW, there is rapid, fast conduction through an accessory pathway. We have anterograde conduction. You do see, I, I don't know the percentage, but I've seen a lot of patients who have WPW. Uh, who also can get AF. And if you've ever seen a fast conducted uh, AF with fast conducted ventricular response through a pathway, it looks very nasty. Yeah. It can, can look like rapid VT or VF. It, it looks very, very ugly. Um, but it's important that a lot of a lot of the testing for in A&E to, 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 to sign a terminate tachycardia is using adenosine because we know that is an AV nodal blocker. And it's very important in this instance that you don't use adenosine with someone with AF and WPW. Because what you end up doing is you block the AV node, then all the signals then all go down the uh, pathway. And then you could be in some real trouble. So it's really important that if you are going to be using adenosine, that you, you're very confident that the patient is, isn't is in AF with, uh, with WPW. Uh and then, Dr. Duff, I think we have a little bit of noise coming from your mic. Jared, do you mind putting a mute on really quick? Sure thing, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, Dr. Duff, I think it's your mic, if you don't mind muting. Um, perfect. Thanks, Jared. You can come back on, my bad. Um, interesting. So, uh, I guess with the WPW statement you just made, um, adenosine would separate or would take the AV node out of the equation, but how would that, how could that speed up the rate, I guess? How would the AV node yeah. not just contribute to more beats in between the AFib conduction, I guess? Because, uh, yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, my understanding is, is that a lot of, a lot of the signal in during WPW, why you have that kind of first kind of that delta wave, but then a relatively fast uh, kind of rapid conduction at the end of the QRS is because it, you get a bit of fusion you got anterograde conduction going through the node mm. and through the ventricle. So it's kind of like, it's almost like you can always say it's, it's sharing the workload. Um, so you get that conduction going through the pathway and the node as well. If you suddenly block off the node, then it's kind of like, well, all the signal then just rushes through that one pathway. Mm. Uh, and then you get this rapid response of just atrial fibrillation conducting through the pathway, because as we said, it doesn't have nodal, it doesn't have uh decremental property so it's not like it can ever block or anything like that so it's almost like opening the doors and say everything come through and gotcha. you end up having a uh you know two three hundred fib waves conducting down to the ventricle quite rapidly that would not be ideal no <laughs> when you need a cardio version i guess yeah in that instance you are you're not even really thinking of diagnosis i mean you get yeah um yeah you're cardio at that point okay Awesome. And at which point, once you cardio, then the chances are you will do a 12 lead and you'll probably see that the patient then has WPW on their ECG. So yeah, a broad, a broad complex with AF is, uh, yeah, just, you might just want to rule out, um, yeah, giving a denizen, in, making sure that, uh, yeah, cardio probably is your first uh, approach. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Joma is an electrophysiologist. Uh, I just, I, she's in the, she's in the uh, lecture uh, Zoom. Can maybe can you reach her whether she can maybe add one or two things to what we are learning today? Um, you will see Keru. A Keru is Joma. Joma. Is that a question? I missed that. No, it's not a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Dr. Joma, uh, Dr. Kuro said they're not available right now, but it looks okay. like they're in the chat. Okay. So we can follow up later. I mean, we'll, we can have a follow-up talk next week and, you know, go over that. But she said it, she agrees with everything that was said. Oh, I, I've seen her write-up. 
Yeah. Perfect. So, um, Jared, did you have more to cover? Or was this? Uh, do you have other slides? Or no, that was it, sir. That was okay. It. So, oh, yeah. it's, sorry. Yeah, uh, Jared, as um, as you mean, uh, you described um, AV nodal reentering and AV reentry tachycardia. So, assuming a patient has this and a combination with either atrial tachycardia or had a combination with atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, what is there any other maneuvers that you can also do in the EP lab to help you uh, distinguish that this is what you are dealing with? Because um, I was very keen to your lectures when you uh, when you mentioned that as the patient comes in, the first thing that you focus on is how to rule out this uh, the plenty of these differentials. So uh, that is one. Then two, uh, under what condition will you uh, pace you um, focus your pacing in the atrium and watch the conduction? And also, under what condition will you focus your pacing in the ventricle and watch the 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 uh, the, uh, the retrograde conduction into the atrium? So I just want you to maybe throw some light on all this area for our for us who are your listeners. Yeah, sure. So I'm trying to answer your first point. Um, Usually the maneuvers that I spoke about tonight, although very brief and quickly, um, and I'm happy to go back and you know go over this at a later point. Dr. Daffe, do you mind going on mute for us though? We're getting a little feedback from your line. Sorry, Jared. Thanks. That's no, fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the take-home message is that the maneuvers that I spoke about tonight is really for the patients who present to your cath lab with typical kind of history of SVT, I suppose. Um, I think we're all fairly comfortable perhaps looking at an ECG and going, well, that's atrial fibrillation. Um, perhaps it's atrial flutter, that's very clear. But sometimes as I, if we go back to, you know, you look at these ECGs here, you could have a, you could have a rough idea what these are. And just for context, this ECG here was AVNRT. This ECG here was an AVRT. And actually, this ECG here was a, a fascicular VT. So, three very different pathologies, but all kind of within reason as, as an ECG looking very similar. So, you've got to use your ECG one. Is it AF? Then that, that is what you treat. Um, is it atrial flutter on the ECG? Then that is your primary kind of. But if that's what they're presenting with, and then that's what you treat. Um, but these narrow complex tachycardias in the right patient with the right history, um, then your focus will be going down that SVT route. And, and as I said before, even after the ablation, we spent a lot of time doing pacing maneuvers. Um, now, in this patient, we ablated a left lateral pathway, but we proved during our pacing maneuvers that she also had dual nodal physiology. So she does have, she does has the ability to have an AV NRT. So again, at the end of that first ablation, we spent a lot of time testing to make sure that we didn't have a bystander, a another tachycardia hidden hidden behind this uh, AV AVRT. Sorry. So it's important that yes, during that waiting period, we're doing different maneuvers. Um, AF's a funny one because you can. As I said, a lot of patients with AVRT, they can present with AF. It's quite typical, but it doesn't mean it's the AF driving their symptoms or it's the AF that gives us this presentation of an ECG. Um, you can pace anyone's atrium quick enough and you will put them in an atrial fibrillation. Now, it doesn't mean that they have atrial fibrillation. It just means that you've paced the heart that quick that you've actually put them into atrial fibrillation. Um, so I think it's for all about treating the initial diagnosis of what you see um, and then sending them off. And then if they present further down the line, perhaps with AF or atrial flutter, then you go and treat that. But I don't think in context very much in an AV, in an SVT setting, we wouldn't go and 
look into the pulmonary veins or we wouldn't look at perhaps doing a cave tricuspid isthmus atrial flutter ablation as well in this setting. Um, so it really is just treating your primary cause. If during that instance, we like I said, we pick up another kind of tachycardia, uh, it depends on where it is. Um, the, the kit that we're currently using means we may or may not be able to treat it there and then. So we may then bring the patient back anyway. So, um, but certainly it's all about treating your, your, your primary uh, pathology first and then worrying about anything else a little bit later on. And your second question was about the pacing. And, um, and that's very much very important. And as I said, this, we always start with ventricular pacing and we always, we want to look at those, um, let me bring it up for you. We want to focus on these three criteria here when we do our VA pacing, uh, ventricular pacing, sorry. You know, do we have VA conduction? Um, and as I said, it's quite important. We can do that in our pacing clinics. Is the VA time decremental? Is it going through the node or a pathway? And most important is what is the CS activation doing? Um, you know, is it concentric? Is it proximal to distal? Suggesting it's going more right atrial to left atrium? Or is it eccentric? Is it distal to proximal? Meaning are we going from left atrium across to the right atrium? And that again, will just help you with your diagnosis. And then we looked at the atrial pacing and obviously, we want to make sure that we always have AV conduction. And you're going to know that from your ECG. So that, that's easy. Um, but importantly, we want to look at this AH time. We want to have a look through this, the, the time it takes to get through the actual node. If it's that time through the AV node is quite quick, we know that they're using the fast pathway. If that AV node conduction is quite becomes quite slow, or we get this jump, sudden jump of greater than 50 milliseconds, then we know that they've got slow pathway conduction. And these patients now have dual nodal physiology, meaning that they have the ability to have a fast and a slow pathway, meaning that they can present, oh, sorry. Um, they can present with, you know, an AVNRT. So we're using all these maneuvers uh, as soon as the patient comes in and making sure that we don't have any of these, or we're looking for these mechanisms and, um, and as I said before, we're kind of ruling things out, ruling things out as we go. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Thank Excellent. You. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jared. Appreciate it. This is, uh, this is very enlightening. I, I myself, you know, I, I would love to know more about EP concepts. So I really do appreciate this. Yeah, I think about EP, it's just, uh, I mean, hopefully I, you can take one or two things out tonight. As I said, you could spend hours talking about this and teaching. And um, But the thing with EP, a lot of the, it's the concepts is are sometimes the easier bit to get. Um, it's seeing it because it's going past at a rate of knots um, very fast on the screen. So it's picking it up as, you know, these signals as they whip by. It's, uh, that's, the, that's the hard bit. But um, certainly having the understanding of the mechanisms and what it could be is the important bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what's their what's their success rate then of ablating like um like an accessory pathway like this one? Like oh, almost a hundred percent usually. Wow, fantastic. Wow. And same with AVNRT. Very rarely have I seen a redo AVNRT. I mean, we look at an AF ablation, you're looking at maybe 60% success rate in someone who's persistent AF. So, you know, there's a high redo rate of AF ablations. But the redo rate of, say, something like atrial flutter or SVTs, whether it's AVNRT or AVRT, is very, very low. Wow. Very successful and very, uh, yeah, a very, very successful procedures usually. Fantastic. Awesome. So the uh, are there any more questions before we change gears here? We're just going to cover that quiz here in a second. Yeah, cool. I'm going to stop sharing, AJ. Okay, perfect. I'll reclaim host. So uh, it's really funny, you know. Thanks, Gerard. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very really much. Good. Thanks, thanks, man. That was really good. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Thank you, Doctor. So I'm not sure if anyone has had a chance to look at the quiz, but a lot of this actually directly overlaps. Well, the, the second two questions really directly overlap with what Jared was talking about. 
So let's go ahead and just go down the line here, but I think you'll see it as we go. So um, question one, has anyone had an opportunity to really go through this or, or analyze this? These are the marker channels on an Abbott device. Um, this is kind of like telltale of an Abbott. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you can you all see it? My mouse? Yes. Yeah. We can. yeah. Okay, perfect. Just want to make sure. So you have your atrial sense channel here. Your ventricular sense uh, is marked here. This is going to be your marker channel. And then these are going to be um, what's called, if you customize it, you can have full markers. And I always recommend using this because it gives you all the information that the device is seeing and can kind of help you interpret timing. Um, so A sense, V sense, A sense, V sense going down the line. Um, does Has anyone had an opportunity? Do you want to take a shot at what this was, what these numbers are, A, B, C? Anybody? Elvis, I know you're studying for the IBHRE. It'll probably come up. I'll have a crack if no one else wants to. Sure, go for it, man. I kind of educational guess, but I thought I was looking at that thick black line. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe that was um, PVAB. Yes, sir. Um, so post ventriculatory blanking. Mm -hmm. um, I thought B was perhaps your A to A timing. It is correct. Um, C. I assumed it was the top. Uh, it kind of, yeah. So this is actually PVARP, but ah. technically it's oh, also TARP. So if you, it, a good way, I'll go ahead and just jump into this really quick. The dark lines rec are, are referred to absolute refractory. Okay. Um, so this is your post ventricular atrial blanking where we're at, where the device in the atrial channel is completely blind. And then this would be your PVARP. This whole line across here is your AV delay, specifically your sensed AV delay, and then your PVARP, which is TARP. So technically, yes, C would be TARP if you're okay. looking at it for the whole line. If you're looking at it for just a partial line, it's PVARP. And just for everyone who doesn't know, TARP is their total atrial refractory period or the total time that the atrial channel is, is essentially blind. So it sees an atrial event. It will completely blind itself so it doesn't have any kind of double counting in the atrium or anything going on there um, and then it has a relative refractory period waiting for the ventricular event to occur the ventricular event occurs it re-blanks so we don't have any kind of far field over sensing that could occur on the atrial channel um, and then once that ends it goes into a relative refractory period of pvarp which is trying to block out any kind of retrograde atrial event that could roll up so typically retrogrades fall outside of your PVAB. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if PVAB is too short, or sorry, too long, you could be under sensing real atrial events and not counting them properly. So once again, PVAB, PVARP, total is your TARP. Um, your, a, or your 8A timing, correct, is right here, which is your time from here to here. And then um, the bottom half. Um. D was your V to B time. Yep, correct. E, I'm going to get wrong now because I put I thought E was the P bar. So ventricular refractory period. Yep, exactly. It's V ref. So, uh, so this bottom half of the tree is going to be your ventricular stuff. So this is all going to be atrial. Everything down here is going to be ventricular. So this will be an absolute blanking in the ventricle or V ref. And the reason it's absolute is to avoid, you know, T-wave oversensing or double counting of QRS complexes. Um, so V to V timing, V refractory or V ref. Um, and then this one right here, I'm pretty I sure that was a AV. AV delay. Yeah, AV. Exactly. Exactly. So this would be AV delay. If in this case, it's a sensed AV delay. If it was A pace to V sense, it would be a PAV or paced AV delay. So um, this is just to give you a better understanding of what we're seeing when you're uh, when you're interpreting what's going on with a Abbott device. Any questions from the group at all? I uh, my chat got buried. Not sure if anyone's trying to reach out. Okay, I'll go ahead and move along here. Um, so, what are the calipers measuring here? Elvis looks like he answered in the chat to me directly. Do you want to take a shot at this one? Uh, 
or anyone else. I can't hear anyone at all right now. Hello, is that that refractory again? Is it? Oh. Uh, uh, I think we have something. Hello? Yes, we got you, Elvis. Okay. All right. Um, I I think it's a VA interval. I don't know. So it is, yeah, it's the VA timing is what they're attempting to measure. Um, so as you can see here, we don't have an atrial um, tree, part of the tree here, which means that we're in a ventricular based timing, right? Uh, we're in ventricular programming or ventricular only programming, but we have an atrial channel. So we know we have an active uh, lead in the atrium, but we're just not responding to it, which means we're in a VVI or VOO, um, ventricular only based, right? So we're V pacing. Our total timing is 746 milliseconds. You divide 60,000 by that, that'll give you your actual beats per minute. Um, I'm not going to calculate that in my head, but you measure from the ventricular pace to the atrial sense. And I always do it on a sense amp channel instead of an A bipolar if I can. Um, and then you measure from the peak Ideally, you measure to the far side, but if you have to, go to the peak of the atrial channel. So this one was a little bit more aggressive with how long it extended it. They said the retrograde, so the VA timing was 355 milliseconds, which means that your PVARP, your shortest PVARP, has to be longer than this to avoid any kind of um, PMT. So keep in mind, PMT does not have to occur at your max track rate. Um, so if you ever see a patient that's ventricular paced a sense frequently at a at a consistent rate, and then you go VVI and all of a sudden it's a sense v sense, um, that indicates that you probably have some sort of PMT or pacemaker mediated tachycardia. So here in this case, they're trying to measure it to try to prevent any kind of PMT. And I'll go ahead and freeze this here um, so that if you rewatch this on YouTube, you can pause it and read what it says. But basically, is what it's trying to understand is, is there one-to-one -one conduction? So if you had a consistent atrial rate here that marched out regardless of what rate you pace the ventricle, so if the atrial rate doesn't change when you either speed up or slow down the ventricular pacing, that means they're probably not related. Um, obviously, per our last conversation, um, you can have decremental properties to retrograde, but it tends to be if you're seeing the retrograde not associated with a certain ventricular rate, that indicates either there's some sort of block or it's not true atrial uh, retrograde conduction. Does that make sense for everyone? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So just I, I recommend an implant always checking for retrograde um, just because you never know. Most uh, like Abbott. As surety MRIs out the box have the shortest PVARP at 175 milliseconds. In this patient, if they were to be at a higher rate and then they get retrograde because of a P PVC, the shortest PVARP would be much shorter than this 355, and this patient would have PMT. Um, so just make sure you're programming appropriately for that. And remember, remember your retrograde timing is your sensed AV delay um, plus your retrograde timing. Sorry, your, your PMT rate is your sense AV delay plus your retrograde timing. So if it if you have a very long AV delay and very long retrograde, it will be slower than your max track rate. So I would not trust max track as an indicator for pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Always look to see if there's VA conduction. I've seen people in PMT at like 80 beats a minute all the time, which is not great. Just uh, really, really quickly, AJ. Yes, sir. <laughs> It's, it's really amazing, yeah, what I mean, you're saying, because in I've noticed, I don't know if Gerard is probably seeing this in Boston devices. <laughs> it's really odd, because you, you tend to see, always when you see PMT, you see five of them, five PMTs logged in a stall mm -hmm. arrhythmia, always with Boston devices. You don't tend to see it much with other, other manufacturers. We're thinking, why is it that Boston? Let's see. Almost every second or third patient has got PMT. And, hmm. and I was thinking that, is it because of the, uh, like the sensing algorithm? Like, you know, because normally, it's normally these sets has 0 0.3 millivolts hmm. at GC, you know, in the atrial one. But hmm. it seems to pick up a lot more. And the PVAP is dynamic, normally set between 240 hmm. and 260 two, two, two milliseconds normally. 
a piva normally set up, but it seems to pick up PMT all the time. Well, you Boston, and normally they come in fives as well. And I think we were like, we we're baffled, really baffled. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Jared, have you seen that, Jared? No, not off, no, not off the top. I mean, I'm, I remember back in the day, Medtronic would always have like greater than 254 PMT episodes. It was, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was this random number that it stopped at 254 for some reason, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm really not actually sure how, what the algorithm is to determine when the pacemaker thinks it's PMT as sure. opposed to just a sinus rate, whether it's the same rate over a certain time, I don't know. So I'll tell you with the, uh, with the Abbott devices, Abbott's definitely can be guilty of this, of PMT. I don't know Medtronic uh, well enough to tell you, but it's often because PVARP was just programmed too short, especially the, the uh, rate response of PVARP was just too short. But um, the way the algorithm essentially works, and I, I could actually go through the minutia of it, I have to pull it up to remember it all, but it's looking for this consistent VA timing um, Kind of, but basically what it does is it'll do like a wiggle test and it will change the V to V timing. And if the V to A timing doesn't change, that indicates that they're associated, right? So like if the time it takes from a ventricular pace to an atrial sense is the same, um, and I'm kind of glossing over some idiosyncrasies, but um, if it's consistent, that means that the V is driving the A. If the V to A timing does change when you change the ventricular timing, that means that they're not in sync and it just happens to look like PMT. Yeah. So all these devices have like a PMT detection rate or rate with which you're going to look for PMT. If they have really long sense day V delays and really long PVARPs, then your PMT will probably be below the PMT detection rate, which means you could have patients going undetected PMT. And that's why you may see patients with like really good um, VA or AV conduction having a higher than normal P, uh, V pace burden is because they're having PMT and we're pacing them. And then you'll ask them, hey, do you ever feel like your heart's palpitating? Like, oh yeah, all the time. And it's crazy, you'll see it. I'd, I'd work a lot in like rural Missouri, um, which they don't get the best care out there. And you'd see some patients that have had it for 11 years and you're like, wow, this should have been addressed about 11 wow. years ago. <laughs> wow, excellent, yeah, that's cute. I, thought, I just thought it was really odd with Boston, like you got that, <laughs> yeah, excellent. Yeah. And then let me see. Okay. So this one is, is really interesting. And I think, you know, Jared, you may actually be the expert in this um, when we actually go to explain it, but did anyone have a guess of what this is? It's not easy. I'll tell you that. Hello. Yeah. Elvis. Uh, well, I think it looks like a uh, kind of re-entry. I don't know, because uh, the AV um, interval is quite very short, and that's not physiological. So I think, uh, I'm not sure, but it's obviously not just, it's not that, it's not a ventricular, it's not a true ventricular high rate. It's something is going on somewhere, like a retrograde conduction or so, I'm not sure. That's no, you, you have uh, you have good instincts. So looking at it just at face value, you can see there's the V's and the A's seem disassociated. So your first inclination might be, oh, this is VT, right? Um, but I think you can look at your guides here and say, you know, how wide is this complex? Now, granted, a far field is never going to be the same as an external EKG. But if your far field channel, in this case, leadless, which is not my favorite far field channel, but it works. Um, if it shows a narrower complex, that indicates that this is probably not VT because VTs tend to be wide and ugly because they go um, you know, outside the normal conduction. So that is your first inclination. It's not by any means proof, but if you do some more digging, basically what this argument here is, is AV and RT, right? So if you see here, we'll have an atrial pace, and this is kind of throwing off our rhythm of interpreting what's going on. Um, the atrial pace is occurring because we have a sensor driven rate. So it's trying, it's in a ventricular based timing. The timer runs out for the, what the sensor dictates it should be pacing at. So it paces. It then thinks as a ventricular event that conducted. The timer doesn't run out in this case. So it withholds its atrial pace. Um, but you have this weird pattern here where you have this atrial event occurring as well. 
right after a ventricular event. So the argument of what's occurring here is you're having an AVNRT, it's conducting down to the ventricle and it's conducting, conducting up to the atrium. And then you're having a premature atrial pace here or an atrial pace that's coming across by the device. It's interrupting or clashing with the signal that's hitting in the atrium. Um, and then you're having the natural AVNRT um, ventricular event occur. So if you remember in, I don't know if I can still draw here. I don't think I have my sketches. Let's see. Oh, I do. Anybody have any input while I pull up my mouse here? From the yeah. Zoom. Really nice ECG. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? I'm taking a picture of that. <laughs> oh, you sent yeah. it. To me. Here, let me, uh, well, I'll slide down here in a second so you can get a picture of the actual description. So the guy who puts this together is, is a genius. I'd love to get him to come and talk for us at some point. But we're going to do nice Easter colors because I guess Easter's coming up. Um, so you have your AV node here, right? You have, it's going down to your ventricle. It's going up to your atrium. So this is kind of just going on. And once again, I am not an EP, but imagine that's an arrow. In this case, it's kind of just occurring on its own in the ventricle, right? So this signal is just running around in a circle. It's running up to the atrium. It's running down to the ventricle. It's running up. It's running down. And the quick succession between A's and V's um, indicates that it's not retrograde. If this was retrograde, you have, you'd have a ventricular event, and then you'd have like a it'd run up to the atrium and it would occur like later in the cycle. But because the time between the A and the V is quite short, this indicates that this is probably something to do with the node or there it's not a retrograde at least because retrograde takes longer, right? So this is kind of going on in the node at this time. But when we're atrial pacing here, that means that up here in the atrium, this atrial paced event is running this way at the same time, this ventricular, or sorry, this AV node event is running backwards and up to the atrium. And they kind of just hit here in the middle and nothing happens. But since we're sensing right here, we're not going to see this event that would typically occur right here. We might see some far field of it, but we won't actually see it sensed or running up to our, to our actual lead. Our leads up here, it doesn't see it because they clash away from the lead inside the atrium. So our atrial pacing is really throwing off what we're seeing. If we had the ability to uh, interrupt this, now this is an EGM, so it's recorded. We, we can't go back in time. But if we had, if this was live, if you go to like a VVI or DDI um, and turn your rate down, you'd stop atrial pacing and you would see this like close association. So in reality, what's actually would be occurring is like an atrial vent here and this would not occur. And then you'd have an atrial vent here and an atrial vent here, and this would not occur. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's not an easy one. And the okay. it's, 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 it's not an easy one. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. Sorry, yeah. So I will tell you these. Uh, let's see if I can clear this out. Uh, okay. Um, I will tell you, you know, not all these quiz questions are this hard. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to torture you this much, but at the same time, I think here, if you want to take a picture of what he actually yeah. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I think it's just, it's invaluable to have, um, you know, these like kind of cool examples of, of what you can see out there in the field. And you may not catch it this time, but there may be a time when you see it and, you know, we can talk through it. So. Okay. Fantastic. Good. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. All right. Um, I mean, it's already an Thank hour and a half. I think we probably don't want to waste any more of your uh, your Sunday evening. That's great, AJ. Thanks, mate. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Jared. Okay. That was. Yeah, thank you for was, joining. Thank you, Jared. That, that was superb. Like, thank you so much. Like, I've learned so much. Thank you. Not a problem. Any questions? Um, yeah, drop the group a message or and um, between both AJ and I, we can help uh, hopefully answer any more questions that you may have after. Did, um, did um, AJ, as 